Thanks, Gwen, for your introduction. So today with, uh, with us, we have Matteo Jaramillo. is the co-founder of CEO on, of Form Energy, was previously the vice president of products and programs for Tesla stationary energy storage program. Uh, he spent many years with the company and uh, started Form in uh, 2017. So uh, Matteo, welcome. Thanks so much, Ben. Great to be here. So I think the, the first thing that struck me uh, when uh, we were programming this event uh, was uh, and uh, looking into your company was uh, the incredible uh, founding team that you you have. Uh, so you have like very long experience with Tesla. So you have also amazing co-founders. Uh, so I'm very curious to hear more about uh, the, the team formation. Uh, but maybe before we go into that, uh, let's talk about what is um, Form Energy doing? Uh, if you can give a quick introduction. Sure. Uh, Form Energy is developing the kind of energy storage that we need to um, allow renewables to fully replace uh, thermal generation, so the coal and natural gas. Um, and that means that that yeah, you need some way to store energy over longer periods of intermittencies, more than, of course, just nighttime, right? Sun going down uh, as it does uh, every every night, um, but rather the, the multiple days, the weeks, uh, potentially, that that we see for intermittencies. Um, whether that's because of seasonal imbalances, right, winter sun being less um, strong than, than summer sun, or or just the periods of uh, days that we have lulls in in the wind power, so um, so that's really the goal of the company, um, and to be able to build a technology that uh, not only accomplishes that um, that function for the system, but does so in a scalable way and is a is a deployable at scale uh, uh, technology. Um, if we come up with the perfect battery that's very very cheap, but we don't have very much of it, what well, doesn't do much good. Um, so from the very beginning, the goal is not just to uh, uh, solve that um, problem, uh, really low cost, multi-day storage, but also do so in a very scalable way. Um, so that's what we're doing. Yeah, because that's something that's not often talked about when talking about renewable energy as the, you know, the solution for reducing uh, CO2 emissions uh, is that uh, really storage is the, the Achilles heel, uh, particularly long term and low cost storage. So what's wrong with today's batteries so that you, you might need a, a new technology in that field? Well, for, for this particular function, the, the challenge is that they simply cost too much. Um, all of the forms of energy storage um, are too expensive to address that this other uh, application, which is the, the multi-day uh, application. And, and there's a lot of terms that are sort of out there these days. Uh, one of them is long duration storage. Another is sort of seasonal storage. Um, we use the term multi-day storage to, to, re to refer to pretty specifically uh, the, the function that this kind of thing needs to perform in the market. Um, and, and to do that thing, um, you, you really do need to be uh, very, very low cost from a CapEx perspective. And that's where the, the current option set uh, is, a, is a little limited. Um, frankly, things are just too expensive to be cost effective um, over those durations, so multiple days into, into weeks. Um, lithium ion, which we all know and love, uh, is a fantastic chemistry, um, incredible density, incredible cycle life. Um, it's also too expensive for this particular application. For cars, for phones, for laptops, it, it's amazing. Um, and, and even for large sections of uh, functionality on the grid, it's also fantastic. Um, short duration, uh, you know, single digit hour uh, applications, peaking functions, for example, um, it is it is fantastic or intraday uh, sort of smoothing and firming. Um, but again, for, for that, the other application, which is much longer duration, multiple days, uh, it's simply too, too expensive. And um, and so that's why something new is needed. Um, that's why uh, new approaches are are required here in this space. Um, and the trick is to pick the right trade offs. Um, nothing in this world is without some trade offs. Um, and that's especially true in the world of, of energy storage. And so uh, you don't just get the really low CapEx um, for free. You do have to trade something off there. And, um, and so that's been part of the process for Form is to think about those right trade-offs um, and to very deeply an and analytically understand them um, and then make the right ones. Um, so, so that's how we've gone about it. Okay. And uh, the technology you picked uh, is actually uh, one that's fairly surprising because it's iron air battery. Uh, and that's a technology that's not really heard about, even though it was explored a few decades ago, uh, partly unsuccessfully. So how did you settle on that technology? Yeah, that's right. Um, maybe said a little bit differently uh, in, in, a, in a common uh, way of saying it. We are rusting and unrusting iron. Um, that's what this battery is. And, um, and you're right. It's a chemistry which um, has never been commercialized before, although it was uh, first investigated going back 40, 50 years. Um, a couple of federal uh, agencies uh, took a close look at it. Um, 
And the reason it wasn't commercialized is because it doesn't work for other applications. Um, it, again, it doesn't work for cars. It doesn't work for laptops. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't until recently that we sort of saw this uh, confluence of context come together where you need something which is very, very cheap, which iron is, of course, um, and uh, where you could make the right trade-offs, um, for example, around efficiency, or if you needed to, around cycle life. Um, and I'll give you one example for, for the kinds of trade-offs that we're talking about. If you have a battery that runs for an entire week, right, discharges over the course of a week, well, that means it takes about a week to recharge that battery. And uh, that means that over the course of a year, theoretically, the maximum number of cycles you could get would be 26, right? two weeks going into 52 weeks. Um, and then over the course of a 20 year life asset, well, then your target is sort of in the low hundreds of, of total cycles. In other words, a very far cry from the thousands of cycles that lithium ion gets today and which is in, being increased um, as we go. Uh, so, so selecting for a chemistry that is very low cost and very si high cycle life is, is not really the, the trade that we should be trying to make. Now, the, the chemistry that we have selected, this iron air chemistry, it does cycle perfectly well, but it means that we're not trying to optimize it. It means that we're not trying to trade off cost to get more cycles. We have plenty of cycles and what we need to do is just drive out uh, increasingly uh, more and more cost. So, so that's one way to, to sort of think about why this chemistry is appropriate. It does trade off um, a lot of these other things uh, that are out there in the right ways to get to that really low CapEx cost. Um, and, and you do need the really low CapEx cost combined with lithium ion on the grid to get the lowest levelized system cost of renewable, reliable, decarbonized energy. Well, that's uh, it's uh, really interesting to have found a, a way to kind of revive a technology that was explored on the, on the now uh, suddenly turning viable. Uh, and I think it, ha it probably has a lot to do with actually how the, the company came about in particularly uh, it, its founding team. So uh, from a, an earlier conversation we had, you were mentioning that you, you have been always interested in energy for actually a really long time, uh, even pre-Tesla. And when you set out to start this company, you didn't really have the, the full team, nor even picked actually the technology. Is that right? That, that's right. Um, yeah, and my co-founders are, are fantastic. Um, it, it's amazing to be a part of a team as strong as we are today, but but even when it was just the five of us uh, getting together, and it's uncommon, of course, to have five co-founders. But the reason why we all came together is because one, none of us has. This is not our first time through. We, we're, we've all been through the gauntlet before on energy, and and many of us uh, energy storage specifically uh, technologies, and uh, finding a group of like-minded folks who really wanted to go for what we felt was the frontier, this multi-day storage. Uh, was was really motivating and and to be able to to work with those folks um Ted Wiley, Marco Ferrara, Billy Woodford and Yet Ming Chang has just been tremendous and and we're is still obviously the core of the company and uh and and we all brought something very different to the table even as as five co five co-founders you may think oh there's a lot of redundancy there but in, but in fact we're we're very complementary uh, to each other in the way that um we approach the business and and approach the development of of this technology um, so it's it's been fantastic, you know. We're now coming on on four plus years, uh, the team now is well over 150 uh, folks, and uh, we continue to sort of build that spirit um, that, that we started with. It, it looks like you were in this very fortunate situation due to your combined backgrounds to be able to raise on on the team's profile and the mission. Is that right? That, that's right. Um, we also were very fortunate to, to come along at a time when when the appetite for investors was just starting to be there. Uh, there's a long, uh, tattered history of, of, of mismanaged uh, energy storage investments. And so that's made a lot of people gun shy in the, in the in investing industry. Uh, but what we came along with at the time, this was early 2017 or so, uh, was, a, was a thesis that this kind of energy storage technology would be relevant for the market in in a time frame that uh, was probably faster than what was being accounted for. And we did not have that technology in hand, as you mentioned. What we had was a very strong thesis that this would be needed and that we could characterize it and that we could characterize the market for it uh, in the relevant time frames. And the investors that, that joined the, the table in the Series A um, at, by the end of 2017 were those kinds of investors who wanted to take the long range bets, who were willing to bet on the team without us having a technology in hand uh, and we're very patient um, about how long it might take. And then we all looked around the table and said, well, this might take 10 years. Are we okay with that? Uh, and, and the answer was a resounding yes. 
And so uh, all credit to our investors who, who put the faith in us at the time, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, Prelude Ventures, um, The Engine, uh, and a couple of others, uh, those were the lead investors, um, was just, it, it really set the table for uh, taking a really big swing and, and thinking very big uh, about it. And, and as it's happened, the market has moved much faster than, than even we had anticipated going back four years ago. And uh, the technical team led by Billy uh, Woodford has, has made amazing linear progress uh, on the technology itself. And the, the analytics platform developed by Marco uh, has really given us a map for, for where to go and how to go about it. Uh, there, there's really no trying to develop a new energy storage technology without really understanding very deeply the value that that, that kind of technology that you're contemplating could bring into the market. And so uh, having all of those things together uh, in the co-founders um, that we have has, has been amazing. So it's really interesting you mentioning that uh, when you started, you, you kind of had the thesis that there was a big problem with storage. And you were confident that, or at least you thought that there was a good chance to find a solution that would be viable uh, in the long term economically. Uh, but it, it sounds also like uh, at the time, the funding landscape wasn't as complete, uh, like on the, on the full, like full stack as it is today. Um, so th did you fear that you might encounter some funding problems down the road? It was a leap we were willing to take. Uh, but on the other hand, having the investors that we did at the Series A gave us the confidence that they were going to be there for us over the long term, even if the later stage capital didn't show up in, in some relevant way. And so having the, the kinds of funds like, like what Prelude, uh, the engine and, and Breakthrough are, uh, gave us the confidence that, that no matter what, they were going to be there with with capital if, if we needed it, and and assuming we were we were going to be successful there. Um, and, and you're right that the market did did maybe feel a little bit away, and we had a strong thesis that that it was going to going to come our way. Uh, but again, it did it it all happened you know much much faster than than we had anticipated. I'd like to go back to your personal journey into the into uh, that led you to this company. So uh, we mentioned you were part of the kind of Tesla mafia that's now uh, creating a number of companies. Uh, there's uh, also JB Strobel, with whom you work with, uh, that's uh, that founded uh, Redwood Materials in uh, lithium ion battery recycling and other activities. Um, and uh, your team of co-founders, amazing, it's like the energy yeah, Avengers, yeah. essentially. Um, but uh, what, what I'm really curious about is how did you develop um, personally this uh, thesis or this vision that, that uh, energy and batteries would matter so much? Um, how did you decide to commit your career to it? Well, it, it goes back pretty far in, in, my, in my life, frankly. Uh, I, I come from a town called Salinas, California. Uh, which is very agricultural center. Uh, we grow a lot of lettuce uh, there in, in Salinas, and um, and my parents are public servants and and working for uh, the, the local community, essentially farm workers, and uh, just seeing their commitment to to that and and understanding uh, the interplay between uh, those communities and 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 the role of energy, frankly, um, in those communities, uh, put me on that path, and I, I started studying uh, energy economics. That, that was sort of what I studied uh, as an undergraduate um, because it was compelling to me to think about uh, the, the kinds of uh, markets that, that develop and, and who's impacted in certain ways and, and who's not. And um, uh, I just don't have the, <laughs> the personality, it turns out, for uh, sort of public service in that regard. Uh, but, I, but I am and always have been fascinated by technology. Uh, I ended up taking a bit of a, a detour on the professional pathway. I, I ended up going to divinity school and I, I have a master's in theology mm -hmm. um, and while there uh, i did contemplate going into the priesthood uh, but but again that was not really for me and, and sometimes it takes or for me anyway it took uh, g getting there and being very up close uh, and taking a look at it to, to make that determination but uh, thankfully i i uh, i was led to that decision <laughs> in the right way yale i went to yale divinity school and they do a fantastic job helping people professionally vocationally discern uh, what really works and and that just wasn't for me um, but, but it, equipped at the time with sort of these vocational discernment skills, like how do you know what you're good at and what you really want to do? Um, and knowing that I, I want my vocation to, to matter to me uh, and to be impactful in the world. Um, I took those skills and, and, and basically said, okay, try to answer the question. Well, what should I do? Uh, what, what do I want to work on? And um, so uh, through that process, um, I'll skip a lot of the details, but, but through that process, uh, arrived at um, the world of energy, broadly speaking, um, the world of energy technology and looking at the time, this was the early 2000s, 2003, 2004, 
uh, it was very clear even then that 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 uh, solar and that wind prices were coming down that almost certainly they would come down even faster than than guessed and if we were going to rely on intermittent sources of uh, renewable generation well then my broad thesis was that at some point we'd want very effective uh, and compelling scalable ways to store that energy and so 20 years ago i basically made a sector bet and said i i think that's going to be important and i'm committed to being a part of that so so that's how i first uh, got into energy storage and uh, again that was in 2004 so uh, now almost 20 years ago wow that's uh that's very early commitment and what's really interesting is that uh it feels that in a, a in recent generations, but also in people like you who are like a long executive career or, uh, you know, um, um, entrepreneurs who, are, who have built other companies uh, before, there's now more and more interest in uh, those, you know, global scale topics on the, uh, definitely like COVID made, made us all realize that, uh, you know, we're, we're all connected in some way. Um, do you feel a change in the, the mindset of uh, scientists, engineers, the people you might hire or you might encounter uh, toward the, let's say, the, the concerns you had already 20 years ago? Uh, certainly there's a change. And I think that's because the, the impact of, of climate change and the impact of the interconnectedness just in general about where we are uh, is no longer remote. It's, it's not easy to say any longer, it's, or it's not easy to, to deny that that all these are, are deeply interconnected, complex systems, and that there is a role to be played for anybody who wishes to, to play a role there. And so we see certainly people who are coming into the, into the company into Form Energy, uh, people more and more are coming from other industries or you know obviously fresh graduates as, as well. They have a keen interest to do that. But I would say that there there is a role to be played pretty much from any vantage point. Um, you know, there's sort of a saying going around that your next job will be in the cl in climate, whether you whether you know it or not. And and I certainly think that's true. You don't have to be working on a battery technology, for example, in order to to have an impact working in climate. Uh, and whether that's from a consumer goods perspective or it's, uh, you know, at a, a public service uh, function or whatever it may be in between, uh, there is a way and there is a role to be played in interacting with with climate mitigation and and uh, and, and rising to the challenge of, of, of the change that we have before us. So, so certainly it feels different than even just a few years ago where, where people sort of you know, felt like that was somebody else's job to do or, or they didn't know how to engage. And, and that's just not really any longer the case. Um, there, there, every, every entity, every, every person has a role to, to be played in and, and can play their, their part. I'd say another question I have would be, what does the end game look like for your company, uh, but more, more generally for maybe energy storage technologies? I remember we had conversation uh, where you were describing basically the emergence of some kind of new asset class. Could you could you exp like develop that idea? Sure. Um, when we, you know, what what does the end state look like? I think it does look like uh, uh, from an electric grid perspective, um, table stakes to hitting two degrees uh, uh, goal is that we decarbonize the electric sector. And, and so that means um, one, that we electrify a lot of things, right? transportation, heavy industry, these kinds of things, and that we decarbonize the source of that electricity. And so, uh, so that means that by, by 2040, 2050, pick your timeframe, um, that does need to be a fully decarbonized sector. Um, and, and so I, I am very confident, now I work on the technology side of things and I'm an entrepreneur, so I sort of must be optimistic here. Uh, I also think it's true uh, that we will end up with a decarbonized, uh, fully reliable and very affordable electric system. And so, so what does that imply? It implies that, of course, we, we go and develop and deploy a lot more of the existing technologies that we had, the, 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 uh, the carbon-free technologies. Uh, but it also means that, that newer technologies are, are coming uh, to play a role. Uh, what Form Energy is trying to do, as I mentioned, was this develop and, and deploy at, at massive scale, this multi-day energy storage system. And, and that really means that you're creating a new asset class to be invested in. Right? The, this notion that that you can um, uh, provide all that function that the that the thermal resources are providing today. Well, uh, natural gas is an asset class. Coal is an asset class. Um, we've seen capital basically start to really pull back from that, especially on coal. I think increasingly it will happen on natural gas. We already see uh, early indications of that uh, in in pockets in the market. Um, that will pick up steam, um, and it means that that we need new new classes of assets to be able to invest in. There's a ton of capital that has to go somewhere, 
that is very actively looking for uh, decarbonization pathways to invest in, right? ESG, broadly speaking, and also infrastructure, which is sort of you know necessarily a part of that. And and so our approach is not just we're developing a battery and it's a device and it gets deployed, but, but rather that it is a, an entire asset class and, and into that class, massive amounts of uh, capital can come. And so that defines the way that we're approaching the development of the product, the product itself, uh, the way that we are establishing the bankability of it, right? It, it, we're not done. Our work is not done until there is low cost financing available for the assets. That's when we know we're done. We can't just prove it to ourselves. We have to prove it to the financiers. That's how this world uh, moves around, frankly. And so, so from very from the very beginning, from from day one of the company, we knew that that was our end state, uh, our desired end state. And uh, and so, when we run the the future of the grid all the way out, it means you need not just devices; you need asset classes that are investable, bankable, durable, reliable pieces of infrastructure. And so, that's been the mentality. And I think that's where we end up. Now, I, I think the forum is a very good chance to succeed and be, be you know, one of those core uh, pillars of, of these new asset classes that are out there. But certainly there will be others. Um, hydrogen, for example, that will be a, uh, an investable, bankable, scalable, deployed asset class. Uh, but we expect to be right there alongside. That's a very exciting future you're describing. And I definitely hope that uh, Form Energy becomes part of the, an important part of this future. Matteo, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Great to be here. And now back to our host at the SOSV Climate Tech Summit.